that's Pierre Bourdieu, pretty spunky guy, as you can see. Uh, but when you start read, reading him, somehow he becomes a bit less spunky. Uh, I just want you to read this and enjoy the conditionings associated with a particular class of existence. Systems of durable, structured structures, predisposed to function, structuring structures, principles which generate and organize practices. I'll let you enjoy it poetically. Uh, if you find it a bit masochistic to engage in it, think that sometimes it is given to school children in Paris. <laughs> and of course, they thoroughly enjoy it because they just like capture it ironically for all it's worth. And sort of like I've heard people sort of like dividing the class between structuring structures and structured structures. They say, where's the structuring structures? The other structure structures. <laughs> and having lots of fun of it. But I want, I want you to read this, but uh, I also want a kind of like mini test for my skills as a lecturer, perhaps, that uh, when I finish this lecture, I hope you read it again and you enjoy it more. I'll just go very quickly with some of the sources of the difficulty in Bourdieu's work. There is, of course, the classical French intellectual narcissism where you have to be difficult, otherwise people will think that you are a moron. <laughs> and uh, if the person sort of like writing next to you is very difficult, then you cannot afford not to be at least as difficult. And so uh, you can imagine uh, poor Pierre Bourdieu in uh, the Ecole de Haute d'Etude, about ten, 10 doors from his office was Derrida, and kind of like, you know, it was seriously competitive. How can I make sure that I can be as obscure my high school as this? <laughs> there is paranoia. This is uh, a serious thing. I'm not, I'm not giving it to you as a kind of like uh, insight into the psychology of Pierre Bourdieu. I think it is quite important to remember, and it will help you read Pierre Bourdieu if you read him realizing that he writes in a paranoid manner. Uh, what I mean by a paranoid manner is that he is always scared to be misunderstood. And so, and uh, this is something he says himself, about himself, so I'm not kind of like engaging in free psychology here. Uh, he writes, and he gets to a point and says, no, I'm sure, I'm sure the reader is going to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'd better put this sentence to get him or her to understand me properly. And he shoots into a sentence, and midway through the sentence, he said, no, this might mean that he will or she will understand me this way, but right, and you will find these endless long sentences moving left, right, all attempting to stop the reader from misunderstanding the first word pronounced by Bourdieu. And of course, the end result of it is that I have never seen Pierre Bourdieu uh, come to his office and say, I'm so happy everybody's understanding me. He's always whinging about the fact that nobody understands me properly for what, etc. So it's fair. There's also the philosophical inheritance. Pierre Bourdieu uh, takes philosophy very seriously. Uh, Derrida says that philosophy is Pierre Bourdieu's mistress in a very French kind of way, in that 
it is the source of his secret enjoyment. And uh, Pierre Bourdieu is definitely very grounded in uh, philosophy. His first degree is in philosophy. He has a long competitive, I would say, critique of philosophy. He tries to dethrone philosophy from being the ultimate discipline of the thinker in France and wants to replace it by sociology. He wants, he thinks, and he does that because he thinks that basically philosophers love to imagine themselves as floating above society, that the views that they come up with are somehow not positioned somewhere in social reality. Of course, philosophers, that's what they do. They work very hard on coming up with views that are, might call transcendental, that transcend the position from where they are. But Bourdieu keeps trying to want to remind them that no matter how transcendental you want to be, you are still part of the social world, and therefore the views you come up with are located in the social world. Nonetheless, Bourdieu says that philosophers ask the hardest questions there is to ask about the social world. But if you want to start thinking seriously about the questions the philosophers ask, you should do social science. That philosophers are not good, really, at dealing with the questions that they ask so well because they don't engage in empirical research. That's Bourdieu's view. And so uh, he says, but at the same time, he says, a sociology which does not, or an anthropology, which does not attempt to answer philosophical questions is not a sociology worth reading. Not an anthropology worth reading. It has to try and deal through empirical research with some of these deep, if you like, questions that philosophy asks. The other source of misunderstandings in reading Bourdieu is his quite radical perspectivism, which we have an inkling of in his critique of the philosophical. Perspectivism means there is no escape from having a perspective. An utterance that comes out of the world is a perspective on the world. There is no view which is capable of being non-perspectival. But this is not just, you have a point of view, I have a point of view. As we will see, for Bourdieu, our views of the world go hand in hand with the making of the world. So the struggle between perspectives is a struggle for the making and unmaking of the world. It's not just views. It is about how the world is shaped. Finally, in terms of sources of difficulty, I want to especially emphasize his critique of scholasticism, which aims always at positioning views within the practices that are happening. Scholasticism is what he sees it as a philosophical, philosophical sin, if you like, par excellence. It is the sin of thinking that the world is made for philosophy. What he calls confusing the things of logic with the logic of things and beautifully injecting into the object one's relation to the object. These are terms he used. What he means by this is that well, the classical example he has used in many of his lectures is the grammarian grammarian sitting by the beach with his students and someone in the sea shouts, shark, here, coming, shark. And he looks at him and says, and he looks at his student and he says, very bad grammar. 
And it is then about thinking that the world exists for you as what your discipline wants it to be. And you inject your discipline into the world and make it as if this is what the world is. This is the idea of scholasticism. Now, with this in mind, I want to start thinking, taking you about how to approach Bourdieu and understand the totality of his work. The first thing you you have to remember about Bourdieu is that his sociology and anthropology is what we call an economy of social being. An economy of social being. Economy means things are produced, distributed, Unequally, Bourdieu is an anti Shakespearean. To be or not to be is not the question. He said, why? Because he says, being is not an either or question. Being is a how much question. Being is unequally distributed in the world, as he would put it. Being in the sense of a fulfilling being. Our life, as we pursue a fulfilling life, is not fulfilling to the same extent. Some people have a lot of being, some have a very little bit of being, but also being is not just distributed. We are actively trying to accumulate being. And sometimes we inherit a lot and it's easy for us to have a satisfying life. Sometimes we are scraping the bottom of the barrel for a little bit of being. And the idea of an economy of social being is this. It is to take the production and distribution of a satisfactory life, seriously. How does, do societies create satisfactory lives? How do they distribute them? How do people engage in accumulating satisfaction? How do they struggle among each other? This is the way to approach Bourdieu. Not, this is the way I am. Uh, if you think I'm totalitarian, I'm sorry, but this is the only way you can fully understand the totality of what Bourdieu is offering. Now, this accumulation of being for Bourdieu involves three modes of accumulating being. You accumulate being through how you invest yourself in life. And you accumulate being by seeking recognition. And you accumulate being by accumulating practical efficiency. I want my life to mean something. I invest myself in life. I go into things that I like and I start working towards maximizing this. I want recognition and I want to be practically efficient. Practically efficient in the sense of I can classify the world properly, I can deploy myself, this idea of deploying yourself in the world efficiently. Managing to do what you want to do is very crucial. Now this idea of accumulating social investment Accumulating recognition, accumulating practical efficiency are at the core of Bourdieu's key anthropological concepts. Social investment <coughs> leads to his concept of illusio. Recognition leads to his concept of capital and practical efficiency leads to his concept of habitus. These three concepts, we'll we'll go into them a bit by bit, 
before moving to his sociological concepts. What I mean by key anthropological concepts here, and I don't mean the discipline of anthropology, I mean concepts related to questions about how human beings live their life. Anthro, I'm taking the anthropo here seriously. It's about the logic of being a human being. And when I move to sociological concepts, I'm not moving to the discipline, I'm moving to the question of what and how we can understand societies. And so both sociology and anthropology have anthropological and sociological concepts. Illusio. Illusio is actually a term that Bourdieu takes from Aristotle. Bourdieu loves these modes of conceiving of being as an interplay between the self and society. For instance, reality means something to me, means my life is meaningful. I give, there's this interplay. I occupy reality. I become, that is, I take a position in reality and the moment I occupy reality, reality occupies me. I become preoccupied. This act of being occupied yourself as you are occupying, the interplay between occupying and being occupied plays a very crucial role in his conception of how people ground themselves in social reality. Illusio is on the side of illusion, of course. And this illusion is linked to the fact that, like many anti-clerical, anti-religious thinkers, or non-religious, Bourdieu thinks that life does not have an intrinsic meaning. That life and the meaning of life is not given from the start. We come on earth in this Bourdieuian uh, en attendant Godot play and said, what the hell is going on here? So why are we here? What is the meaning? And there is no meaning. We convince ourselves that life is meaningful when society starts giving us. When I, I start playing this game of reality gives me a meaning, my life becomes meaningful. So it is society which distributes meanings of life. This is, by the way, a very Durkheimian view of society. And Bourdieu is very much in the Durkheimian tradition here. Society distributes meanings of life. But, of course, we, if we have such an awful secular view that society distributes meaning of life, meaning of life will be boring. So we like to actually convince ourselves that there's nothing before and after the meaning of life. Life is meaningful, for God's sake, in itself. This is where the illusion lies. That is, we have to sell ourselves the illusion that life is intrinsically meaningful, that it's not just something contingent on us being positioned in the social. And illusio is also, and that's very specially linked to Aristotle's use of illusio, is linked to illusionis, which is about, okay, I'm going to invest myself in life. What is it going to yield for me? It is about what is the yield of your investment. It's a gamble. Illusion is here is about the notion of the illusion is about the gambling with one's life. Okay, I think uh, I've just come out of university. Uh, and uh, I have uh, middle-class parents, and I've had an easy life, and I have the choice of either I'm going to take a job immediately or I'm going to go uh, in Africa, to Africa, and uh, realize my ethical self for a little while before uh, coming back. 
I am making a choice by investing in myself, and my life's meaning will depend on the choice that I make, but I am making calculation. What will it yield if I do this? What will it yield if I do that? It's a question of where you invest. So this is illusio. So you accumulate being by accumulating illusions. Two very important things here. The accumulation of being is not just quantitative, more and more being. You accumulate being by accumulating intensity of being. And intensity of being, for Bourdieu, is linked with what he calls social gravity. Society sucks you in, like gravity. If you invest yourself in life, as the illusion goes, if you, the more life means something to, to you, the more you really have dipped yourself in life, the more everything about this life becomes meaningful to you, the more life sucks you in. It has a gravity, social life. It pulls you in. It becomes hard for you to leave it. I think many of us here who have done ethnography would know what it's like. It's not easy to go and live with people and just say, okay, bye, see you later. The first time you meet some people, you can't do it. The second time, it becomes harder. The third time, fourth time, it becomes harder and harder. You enter a social world, it sucks you in. It becomes harder to come out of the social world. That's what it means to have social gravity. And social gravity has its own dynamic of giving being a qualitative, not just a quantitative touch. Another very important concept linked that Bourdieu produces linked to illusio is what he calls social aging. This is a very uh, important uh, operational concept. Social aging is about the shrinking of life's opportunities. What Bourdieu is saying is that if you are young, you have in front of you a multiplicity of illusions. I can be this, I can be this, I can be this, I can be that. I am the opportunities of investing myself in life is so multiple and plural. But as I socially age, not necessarily physically, it might, they might go hand in hand, but not necessarily so. But the process of social aging means that you become increasingly ossified, so to speak, and your capacity of investing yourself in a diversity of things shrinks. And so you might be able to do one or two. The more you are socially aging, the more the opportunities of life shrink for you. So that's as far as the accumulation of illusion. Being as accumulation of efficiency is linked to the notion of habitus. Habitus is, of course, a word which is very playful because, on one hand, it invites you to think of something you are familiar with, habit. On the other, it kind of like plays with the lay person, this game where it says you come and understand it, but no, you can't understand because it's Latin, habitus. 
And, <laughs> and because it's less than habitus, there's something too difficult about it for you, little idiot. Let me tell you about it. This is how academics establish their super duper credentials in the social world, by the way. So there is a difference between habit and habitus, of course. Although linguistically, sometimes what we call habit used to be habitus, and what is now known as habitus used to refer to habit. But it's a long story. But Habitus has something of habit, but something else. Bourdieu calls it a mechanism for the transformation of passivity into activity. And we might aid, add here creative activity. It's a kind of like scheme of thinking that habitus is a mechanism. Now, mechanism, structure. It's a structured structure. It is mechanism, it's a structure. Now, I have to stop here and get you just an inkling of the difficulty of what we're doing here, at least as far as Bourdieu is concerned. Bourdieu is a social scientist. He's a perspectivist. He is aware that he has a, for him, there is no such thing as the world, and I know the world. This is my perspective on the world. There is a social scientific perspective on the world. And this social scientific perspective on the world produces specific things linked from the perspective of social science. What is my perspective on the world? I want to understand the world. Okay, I want to understand how a human being works. So I produce categories to help me understand how a human being works. I don't go around and tell everyone this is what there is. I tell everyone who wants to understand the social world this way. But I don't go around in the street and say, you have habitus, believe me. No, it's, about, it's a discussion among social scientists. Habitus is a theory of what there is. If you are a social scientist and you want to understand, this is what there is. It's the theory of what there is. Habitus, then, is a theory. But it's a theory which is not detached. It's not just a free-floating view. It's an interaction with the real, and it produces an element of the real. So this is... The difficulty, you, we don't want to go into this just as long as you have an inkling of all what is going on here in terms of perspectives. A habitus, a mechanism for the transformation of passivity into activity. The basic idea of this is simple. We human beings internalize and externalize. When we say internalize, it means what is outside of us comes into us. This is nothing mysterious. I'll just use the example of language to just consistently use one simple example across to make you understand it. A baby comes into the world with no great grammatical or linguistic capacities that we know of in any specific language. They sit there, basically. They sit there, and someone hovers on top of them and say, cutie, cutie, blah, 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 ah, you are so lovely, etc. And this baby is sitting. And what is they doing? They're internalizing. And magic, magic, at one point, from internalizing, we can externalize. Suddenly, the baby can speak. And of course, the baby cannot speak any language. It speaks the language that it has internalized. This goes for language, for movement, for behavior, everything around us. 
everything that the baby senses are capturing are internalized and then externalized. But there's a very difficult thing here. It's not just that things are internalized. The baby might inter internalize, you are cute, and it might internalize, you are lovely, and it might internalize, dad is not uh, going to play with you tonight, and it might internalize, whatever, it internalizes, but something happens along the way where the baby is not just capable of externalizing what it has internalized. The baby, it is truly of the realm of magic, if you think about it. It is of the realm of magic. Suddenly, the baby can create new sentences. What we externalize is not just what we internalize. That is, what we internalize ends up having within us a capacity to generate new things. We internalize, we externalize with the capacity. Habitus is this mechanism where the process of internalization produces a generative power, a power to generate new things. 